Hello, everybody. It's Friday, June 5th, and uh, I am coming to you from my office at church today. Obviously, there is a lot going on at the, in the world at the moment. <clears throat> of course, I think for most of us, the, <clears throat> the, excuse me, the protests and the unrest we're seeing in American streets, um, the protests and unrest we're seeing playing out all over the country in American cities is, uh, I suspect, topmost, uh, again, for most of us. Um, for me, when justice is in question, I feel, especially as a, a sort of privileged white male uh, and as a faith leader, um, I feel like it's important for me to turn up and to be present and to be in solidarity uh, with those whose rights or interests are uh, in question with those who are struggling for recognition, for those who are struggling for fairness or justice. Um, so in response uh, to the death of George Floyd, I have felt it's been important for me to be uh, to be part of the protests, to be present with uh, the folks who are calling for systemic change and um, who are lamenting uh, Mr. Floyd's death. And so I've gone downtown to, uh, to join the protests in Asheville. Um, a couple of nights this week, uh, once on Tuesday and then again last night. I've, in both cases, I've worn a mask and I've tried to practice careful, be, I've tried to be careful to practice social distancing. Uh, but in addition to that, yesterday, and those were meaningful experiences, I must say, and the protests, uh, what, from what I could see, I didn't stay until the very end, but the, the protests were quite vocal, but they were peaceful, um, and I was... Uh, I was glad to be there, glad to be part of it, glad to add my voice uh, to the voice of others calling for systemic change and for justice, uh, especially in memory and for George, George Lloyd, Floyd. Sorry. So uh, in addition to all of that, I um, went yesterday, I went downtown to uh, a noontime gathering at First Presbyterian Church. It was actually on Church Street downtown. It was organized by First Pres, uh, Central Methodist, uh, and um, Trinity Episcopal. And it was a vigil call. It was a prayer and action vigil. Uh, it was um, held outside, and so we could all gather safely. And uh, African American leaders, although it was organized by the pastors of those church churches, they gave the platform over to our African American colleagues and sisters and brothers to speak um, and to give voice to their own calls for action, their own voice of lament. And, uh, and it was a meaningful experience. Uh, and so I want to share with you uh, some thoughts that came out of that experience. I've posted these on Facebook, so some of you may have seen these before. And if, if that's the case, I apologize for the repetition. But uh, I know a lot of you are not on Facebook, and good for you. Uh, but uh, uh, So I did want to share these, uh, share these with you because um, uh, I think there's a communal aspect to, to some of what I'm going to talk about here. So this is, um, this is what I shared this morning on Facebook. Nowadays, for someone who looks like me to declare, I am not a racist, <clears throat> is not different from a fish swimming out onto center stage and announcing, I am not wet. Think Finding Dory, a magical marine world for, where fish can talk. As the racism scholar Ibrahim, Ibram X. Kendi, uh, among many others, has exhaustively documented, racist policies, that is, policies that specifically advantage whites over people of color, are so pervasive in all aspects of American life and culture um, that for anyone that anyone lucky enough or unlucky enough, enough to be born white is inundated with pr the privilege that comes with uh, with them. So what does one do? Or to raise the stakes a notch, what do I do? As someone who cares about justice but also occupies a place of privilege in our culture. As someone who longs to realize the foundational American dream of liberty and justice for all, but um, also daily feasts at the extravagantly loaded banquet table of white privilege, I believe the answer to that question is obvious. I must begin to take intentional action to identify, acknowledge, expose, and eradicate racism. Which is to say, I must leave behind the passive and in all likelihood the deceptive luxury of not being racist, and take up the much more demanding and more urgent work of becoming an anti-racist. That work begins on the individual level. <clears throat> it is doubtless an unpleasant task, fraught with fear, shame, and regret. I'm fairly sure I don't relish the prospect of feeling all the harsh feels, all those harsh feel, feelings any more than any other privileged white person might. 
<clears throat> and yet that is where the most meaningful anti-racist work must begin, with oneself. So here is my personal five-point plan for how I intend to engage in the urgent and essential work of becoming an anti-racist in my personal life and of striving to eradicate racism in my wider community. One, <clears throat> educate myself. There is a rapidly growing body of work devoted to the question of how to become an anti-racist. I have read just enough of this material to know I must go much deeper. Two, this is where you come in. Involve others. <clears throat> I plan to invite my friends, family, and the members of my congregation to join me in this educational effort and to read these materials along with me. More on that in a minute. Three, learn from others. I am fortunate to know several longtime campaigners. Some of those campaigners are members right here, black and white uh, folks among them, who have actively worked to resist and dismantle racism for decades. I commit to listening to and learning from them. Four, act. This is a long process. My first action, per the above steps, is to become more informed. But I also commit to taking what I learned to heart and putting this knowledge into action in concrete and specific ways to address racism in myself and in my community. Five, pray. I have enjoyed the benefits of institutional racism my entire life. From the moment I could say my name, I unwittingly assumed I was entitled to these benefits. Over the course of my life, I have profited from these benefits in ways I have not yet begun to name or fully enumerate. I have also lived in happy ignorance, but was it ignorance, really, of how my privilege came at the expense of people of color? So finally, I commit to praying prayers of lament, prayers of confession, prayers for forgiveness and mercy, and prayers for deliverance and guidance as I begin this journey. If you know me well enough to be reading this or hearing this, I invite you to hold me accountable. Ask me what I've read and what I've learned. Ask me how I've put it into practice. Ask me what steps I've taken to address racism in myself and in the wider community. In the days and months and years to come, my hope is that all of us will be able to look back and see the progress we've made, the distance we have all traveled on this shared journey toward liberty and justice for all. So that's what I posted, um, and what I want to say about that is that I, I do hope that you will join me in this journey if you're if you feel called to. Um, we're all on different places in our lives and uh, in our relationship and our understanding of and our response to what we're seeing in the streets of American cities right now in response to uh, systemic and institutional racism as we understand it. But if you feel called to, I would really, uh, I would welcome you and invite you to join me on this journey. Uh, I said earlier in a, in a message earlier that uh, next week I'm going to start a weekly um, Zoom gathering, a weekly Zoom meeting, if you will, and invite anyone who is interested to join me. Noon on Wednesday, uh, kind of a lunchtime conversation format. And I want that. I want those uh, those uh, conversations to be multifaceted. I want them uh, to do what I uh, had talked about earlier. I, I want them to help us to build church and do church uh, in these changed times. And I want us to uh, talk about that. I want us to connect with one another, share our own joys and concerns, what's going on in our lives, to build community that way. But I would also like uh, for those conversations to have at least partially um, a specific focus centered on this question of how to be an anti-racist. And I will provide some uh, materials ahead of time that we can share, read together, that we can read ahead of time and then discuss together. There are, there's a lot of stuff being published uh, around this right now, and some of it is very straightforward, relatively simple uh, to kind of read, much harder to perhaps put into practice. But, you know, sort of step-by-step -step guidance that we're getting uh, from our, in many cases, from our African American sisters and brothers, or other people who um, are are thinking about this and reflecting on it for themselves, white clergy and other uh, faith leaders and uh, community activists. So, I'll gather those resources uh, and put those out ahead of time, and then we can. Um, and then I would love to invite you to to join me on this journey. And I hope to see you um, next Wednesday uh, for that gathering. So. 
And uh, also just to underscore that we will be taking communion this Sunday in worship. I mentioned that in the email that goes out that went out above this message, but I just want to underscore that. I look forward to sharing that with you all this week. So that's it for now. Um, love you all. Peace. Take care.